In the previous lecture, we recalled some of the basic notions of the Earth's sciences, especially the Earth's composition. Our objective in this lecture is to introduce seismic waves and describe how these waves allow us to understand the solid Earth's interior. Again, materials of this lecture and of the previous lecture are important prerequisites for the key topics of the series, which are earthquakes and volcanoes, energy resources, and climate change. Let's start by recalling geothermal gradient of solid Earth. The geothermal gradient of the Earth describes the rate of increasing temperatures with increasing depth of the solid Earth. Note that the gradients illustrated here are only valid away from tectonic plate boundaries and hotspots. The deeper a rock is, the hotter and denser it is. Both temperature and pressure increase with depth. How can scientists, or more precisely geophysicists and geochemists, find out what is happening deep inside the Earth? The temperatures are too high, the pressures are extreme, and the distances are too vast for drilling. How did geophysicists figure out that the mantle is solid, the outer core is liquid, and the inner core is solid? Scientists rely on seismic waves or elastic waves, which are waves generated by earthquakes and explosions that travel through the Earth and across its surface to reveal the structure of the interior of the planet. Thousands of earthquakes occur every year, and each one provides a glimpse of the Earth's interior. Seismic signals associated with these earthquakes consist of several kinds of waves. Those important for understanding the Earth's interior are P waves, also known as primary waves, compressional waves, or longitudinal waves, and S waves, also known as secondary or shear waves. P waves travel through solids, liquids, and gaseous materials in different ways. S waves travel only through solids and viscous fluids. There are also surface waves. The learning objectives for this lecture are to familiarize yourself with body waves, surface waves, P waves, S waves, love waves, and Rayleigh waves. Familiarize yourself with the notions of reflected waves, refracted waves, transmitted waves, and head waves. Understand the difference between wave propagation in non-viscous fluids and in solids. Understand the notions of P-wave and S-wave shadowed zones. Here is the plan we will follow in this lecture. We will start by introducing the important notions of P and S waves. These two wave types are also known as body waves. Elastic, including acoustic waves and electromagnetic waves, are two important ways that energy is transported. These types of waves are central to geophysical studies. Solids are characterized as elastic materials, and seismic waves that propagate in the elastic medium are elastic waves. Liquids and gases are characterized as acoustic materials, and seismic waves that propagate in the acoustic media are acoustic waves. Acoustic waves are particular cases of elastic waves. Elastic waves are generated whenever there is a sudden deformation or a sudden movement of a portion of the medium. 
Again, let me repeat. Elastic waves are generated by sudden deformation or a sudden movement of a portion of the medium. Examples of sudden deformation of the medium include earthquakes, magma movement, nuclear explosions, and man-made explosions occurring during oil and gas exploration. A sudden deformation or a sudden movement of a portion of the medium produce two types of deformations, volumetric changes and changes of shape. P waves or compressional waves are a result of volumetric changes. They are similar to sound waves, which are a series of contractions and relaxations. S waves or shear waves are a result of changes of shape. S wave motion is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. Let's watch and learn to differentiate P wave and S wave. Another illustration of P and S wave motions. Let's watch. In homogeneous solid media, P and S wave motions are independent. That is, if the motion begins as a P wave, it will continue to be a P wave. If it begins as an S wave, it will remain an S wave. Let's watch. To facilitate our description of what we have observed in this movie, let us introduce the mathematical notations of P waves and S wave velocities. P and S waves travel with different velocities that we will denote as VP for P waves and VS for S waves. We have just described how one can generate P and S waves and we have observed that P waves are faster than S waves. Note again that in non-viscous fluids like liquid water, only changes in volume occurs, or only P waves are generated. S wave velocity is zero in these cases. In other words, non-viscous fluids and gases do not support S waves. For a given homogeneous solid medium, or a homogeneous portion of the solid medium, P wave velocity is always greater than S wave velocity. Here is the precise inequality. Seismic waves travel at different speeds in different rocks. There are no S waves in liquids and gases because we cannot change the shape of gases and liquids. It is important to become familiar with the differences between P waves and S waves. These two notions are central to geophysical studies, especially studies related to solid Earth. Actually, nowadays it is almost impossible to succeed in studies of solid Earth without a good understanding of P waves and S waves. So far, we have focused on homogeneous Earth. Let's now look at more realistic cases of heterogeneous Earth. Again, in homogeneous solid media, P and S wave motion are independent. That is, if the motion begins as a P wave, it will continue to be a P wave. If it begins as an S wave, it will remain an S wave. However, 
When interfaces or scatterers are present, we will see that boundary conditions in general generate a coupling between P and S waves. That is, the boundary conditions give rise to the phenomena of mode conversion. Let's start by examining wave propagation through a three-layer model consisting of air, water, and a solid. The air-water interface in this model represents the sea surface. This example mimics, in a very simplified way, the atmosphere, or air, and the oceanic crust. We made an explosion in the water to generate waves. Let's watch. There is a lot of new information. No wave escapes to the air. The wave propagation is limited to water and solid, that is, in the ocean crust. We call the air-water interface a free surface. So the sea surface is a free surface. Notice that in the solid we have two waves, P and S waves, while in the water we only have P waves. P waves travel through solids, liquids, and gases, while S waves travel only through solids. Let's repeat this, as this is a very important result. P waves travel through solids, liquids, and gases, while S waves travel only through solids. We are going to focus on the notion of reflection and transmission. When the wave reaches the interface between the water and solid, part of its energy returns to the water layer from which it came. This process is called reflection. The remaining energy enters the second medium. This process is called transmission. Notice that there are two transmitted waves, P and S waves. Again, this happens because solids support P and S waves. We are going to focus on the notion of refraction, also known as head waves. Focus on the water-solid interface. After some time, waves are no longer transmitted to the solid layer. We have refraction. We have no refraction at air-water interface. That means no surface waves. In summary, when the wave reaches the water-solid interface, part of its energy returns to the water from which it came. This process is called reflection. The remaining energy enters the second medium in a process called transmission. Note also that when the wave reaches the interface between the water-solid interface, it is partitioned into two transmitted waves, P and S waves. Contrary to the water-solid interface, we can see that the reflection at the air-water interface is total. Very little energy is transmitted into the atmosphere because the velocity and density of the air are so low in comparison with the velocity and density of water. The sea surface can be approximated as a free surface. When the incident spherical wave front hits the interface at a critical angle, a so-called head wave is produced. Let us denote VP1 the P-wave velocity of the water, and VP2, the P-wave velocity of the solid. The head wave travels with velocity VP2 along the interface and radiates into the water where the velocity is VP1 less than VP2. 
There is no head wave when BP1 is greater than BP2. There is no head waves at the air-water interface. Because the head wave travels with a velocity higher than the velocity of the solid in a part of its wave path, it arrives significantly ahead of the spherically spreading direct wave that travels from the source to the receivers without hitting the interface between the two half spaces. Again, the energy of the head wave is continuously transmitted into the top half space as it propagates along the interface. When the incident spherical wave front hits the water solid interface at a critical angle, a so-called head wave is produced. Let's consider another three-layer model consisting of an air solid solid in which the air solid interface represents the Earth's surface. This example mimics, in a very simplified way, the atmosphere, or air, and the continental crust. We made an explosion in the top solid to generate waves. Let's watch. Here is some additional information. Look at the air-solid interface. We can again see that the reflection at the air-solid interface is total. Very little energy is transmitted into the atmosphere. The Earth's surface is a free surface. We have refracted waves at the free surface. That is, we have surface waves. And at the solid-solid interface. Again, when the incident spherical wave front hits the interface at a critical angle, a so-called head wave is produced. At the solid-solid interface, we have a head wave if the P wave velocity of the top solid is smaller than the P wave velocity of the bottom solid. The head wave then travels with the fastest velocity, which is the P wave velocity of the bottom solid. At the solid-solid interface, we can have another head wave if the P wave velocity of the top solid is smaller than the S wave velocity of the bottom solid. This head wave then travels with the fastest velocity, which is the S wave velocity of the bottom solid. Let's now turn to the air-solid interface, or continental crust. If the incident wave from the top solid is an S wave, we have a head wave at the air solid interface because the P wave velocity is always greater than the S wave velocity. Head waves at the free surface, that is the air solid interface, are surface waves. So we have surface waves at the Earth's surface. For clarity, let's recall the previous results at the air-water interface, or oceanic crest. In water, the incident wave are always P waves. We cannot have a head wave at the air-water interface. So there are no head waves at the sea surface, and therefore, no surface waves. In summary, when the wave reaches the interface between the two solids, it is partitioned into two reflected waves, P and S waves, and two transmitted waves, also P and S waves. Contrary to the solid-solid interface, we can again see that the reflection at the air-solid interface is total. Very little energy is transmitted into the atmosphere because the velocity and density of the air are so low in comparison with the values for the solid. Therefore, we can approximate the Earth's surface 
as a free service. Let's now elaborate on surface waves. We'll now introduce a second and final category of waves. Before we use the properties of seismic waves to find out what's happening deep inside the Earth. The secondary category is surface waves. Surface waves propagate near the Earth's surface slower than body waves. Love waves move back and forth like a snake. Rayleigh waves move like ripples on a pond. Again, there are two types of surface waves. Love waves are waves which move back and forth in a snake-like movement going side to side. Rayleigh waves are waves which move like ripples on a pond in an up and down motion. This is an illustration of how surface waves shake the ground during an earthquake. Surface waves are responsible for most of the damage done to property during earthquakes. This is an example of some comparative motions of P waves, S waves, and surface waves. At A, you'll see the initial state. B is the result of P wave motion. C is the result of S wave motion. D is the result of surface wave motion. This is another comparative illustration of the motions of P waves, S waves, and Rayleigh waves. Remember the question we posed at the beginning of this lecture. How can scientists, more precisely geophysicists and geochemists, find out what is happening deep inside the Earth? The temperatures are too high, the pressures are extreme, and the distances are too vast for drilling. How do geophysicists figure out that the mantle is solid? The outer core is liquid, and the inner core is solid. We have now learned enough to answer these questions. Let's start with the description of recorded seismic waves, generally known as seismograms. In other words, seismograms record the ground motion. The waves in seismograms arrive in sequence. P waves first, S waves second, and surface waves last, which cause most of the property damage in an earthquake. To link waves in seismograms to various layers of the solid, it is useful to adopt this nomenclature. P equals P wave through the mantle. K equals P wave through the outer core. I equals P wave through the inner core. S equals S wave through the mantle. C equals S wave through the inner core. And lowercase c equals the reflection off the top of the outer core within the core. In general terms, P, S, PP, SS, PS, PPP, PSS, and more events provide us information about the physical properties of the mantle, including density, P wave, and S wave velocity. The reflections PCP, SCS, PCS, and more events allow us to detect and characterize the mantle core boundary. SKS, SKKS, SKKP, and more events 
provide us information about physical properties of the mantle and outer core. They also allow us to detect and characterize the mantle core boundary. PKIKP and PKCKP events provide us information about the physical properties of the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. They also allow us to detect and characterize the mantle outer core boundary and the outer core inner core boundary. There are abrupt velocity changes at certain depths that also indicate the layering structure of the solid earth. The crust mantle boundary, or the MOHO, is marked by a change in the P-wave velocity. It was discovered in 1909 by a seismologist named Mohorovicic, a Croatian, as a result of his study of an earthquake in Croatia. By using the time-distance velocity equation for various recording stations, he found that out to about 150 kilometers, the velocity of the upper crust must be about 6 kilometers per second. However, for stations located greater than about 150 kilometers from the earthquake, waves arrive faster and travel with the velocity of about 8 kilometers per second, which is the second slope. He determined that the depth of this P-wave velocity change was about 30 kilometers. This velocity change is the crust mantle boundary, and often referred to as the Morohovicic discontinuity, or MOHO for short. Basically, at short distances, P, S, and PP events will arrive first. However, at greater distances, the refracted events, that is, the waves that travel down to the mantle and travel along the top of the mantle at a higher velocity, can arrive before the waves traveling through the crust only. As described earlier, refracted waves occur when going from a slow velocity medium to a high velocity medium, as is the case here. Let's talk about the mantle core boundary. The mantle core boundary was discovered in 1913 by a seismologist named Gutenberg. Seismologists had previously noticed that P waves were not recorded at seismic stations, which were from 104 degrees to 140 degrees away from an earthquake. In this picture, is the discovery of the mantle core boundary, where P waves do not arrive in the P wave shadow zone. Gutenberg explained this P wave shadow zone by using the notion P wave refraction at the mantle core boundary. Later, an S wave shadow zone was noticed, meaning that no S waves were received at seismic stations from 104 to 180 degrees from an earthquake. The S wave shadow zone is caused by the outer core, which is liquid. In this picture, S waves do not arrive in the S wave shadow zone, or the liquid outer core. The seismic shadows are a global effect of seismic waves from large earthquakes. S waves do not reappear beyond an angular distance of 103 degrees as they are stopped by the liquid outer core and P waves don't arrive between 103 degrees and 140 degrees due to refraction at the mantle core boundary. Let's talk about the outer core inner core boundary. In 1936, a Swedish seismologist named Inge Lehmann recognized waves which were reflected from a boundary deep within the earth. 
she correctly interpreted these reflection events as reflections from the inner core, which is solid iron and nickel. In the 1960s, nuclear blasts allowed for a more precise determination of the radius of the inner core. The United States nuclear blasts were always located at a known spot and were detonated at a specific time to eliminate potential uncertainties that seismologists have to deal with natural earthquakes, whose precise origin, time, and location must be worked out by the travel times themselves. Let's talk about the scientific drilling programs. Drillings, including those below the ocean floor, also play important roles in our understanding of the Earth's interior. The Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, or IODP, and the COLA Super Deep Borehole, or KSDB, are two examples of drilling programs with the primary goal of understanding of the Earth's interior. The Ocean Drilling Program, or ODP, was an international cooperative effort to explore and study the composition and structure of the Earth's ocean basins. ODP began in 1985 with contributions of Australia, Germany, France, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States. In 2004, ODP transformed into the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, or IODP. Buried beneath the ocean floor are records of millions of years of Earth's climatic, biological, chemical, and geological history. Scientific ocean drilling enables collection of subseafloor fluids, microbes, and geophysical and geochemical data by instrumenting boreholes and using networks of boreholes. The IODP program has used the drill ship's JOIDS resolution. JOIDS stands for Joint Oceanographic Institutions for Deep Earth Sampling and CHICU on hundreds of expeditions or legs to collect deep sea cores and other geophysical data from major geological features located in the ocean basins of the world. Scientific ocean drilling permits researchers to assess these records to explore, analyze, theorize, and test models that describe how Earth works. Scientific ocean drilling is truly a multidisciplinary scientific research program including Earth, Ocean, Atmospheric, and Life Scientists. Data from scientific ocean drilling have offered important insights through which scientists have improved their understanding of solid Earth and its cycles, including the interaction and evolution of Earth's crust, mantle, and core. Changes in Earth's magnetic field, the processes of continental rifting, the subduction of the oceanic lithosphere, and voluminous outpourings of magma onto the crust, for example, are significant manifestations of solid Earth cycles and are recorded in rocks on the ocean floor. Climate and ocean change, reading the past, in informing the future is the first of some of the current IODP themes. Continuing on, we have the biosphere frontiers, including deep life, biodiversity, and environmental forcing of ecosystems. The next theme is Earth connections, including deep processes and their impact on Earth's surface environment. The last theme is Earth in motion, including the processes and hazards on human time. 
Now we'll talk more about the Cola Super Deep Borehole. The Cola Super Deep Borehole, or KSDB, is another scientific drilling project with the objective of drilling into the Earth's crust with a goal of reaching 15 kilometers. It was carried out in the former USSR. The high temperature and pressure of the solid Earth make it hard to drill deep into the Earth. KSDB began digging in 1970. In 1992, it reached a final depth of 12 kilometers, which is less than 1% of the distance to Earth's center, and a temperature of 245 degrees Celsius, a very high temperature compared to the temperature at the surface of the Earth. Now it's time for a quiz. How do we know that the outer core is liquid? Is the core a constituent of the asthenosphere? Can P wave velocity be greater than S wave velocity? Can S waves propagate in the sea water? Now let's go over the questions and their answers. How do we know that the outer core is liquid? The answer is that S waves do not pass through the outer core. Is the core a constituent of the asthenosphere? The answer is no. You may see previous lectures for more details. Can P wave velocity be greater than S wave velocity? The answer is not when they're propagating through the same medium. Can S wave propagate in the sea water? The answer is no. As we have described several times in this lecture, S waves do not travel in non-viscous fluid because we cannot change the shape of the water. Thank you.